Okay, I guess we should get started. Uh, it is after 12.15. Um, welcome. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Schoenig. I'm a professor of philosophy here at SAC, and I'll be your host for today's presentation on world religions, facts, comments, and questions. Uh, and uh, I expect my presentation to be 20 or 25 minutes, and at any time during the presentation, if you have questions or comments, just uh, raise your hand and, and uh, I'll entertain those. And when I finish, there will still be time for questions and comments. In fact, in the course of the presentation, I have uh, highlighted certain areas that you might want to think about for asking questions uh, if, if you uh, so desire. All right. So, I have two goals in the presentation. I want to present eight general facts and four questions that I think are useful with respect to world religions. And also I want to invite your comments and questions at any time, as I mentioned. Right. So, some facts about world religion. Let's start with fact number one, and I think I need to taken a course in world religions, uh, there is usually a section, sometimes a chapter, devoted to pointing out how difficult it is to get a, uh, a, a definition that there is a consensus about. Uh, and I'm not going to wrestle with it directly, but I'm going to suggest that one way of distinguishing those kinds of institutions that we want to call religions from others that are maybe like a religion uh, is, is what I'm going to suggest here. So we would want uh, to um, accept Christianity as a religion, Judaism as a religion, Hinduism as a religion, uh, Islam as a religion. We don't want to accept vegetarianism as a religion or rooting for the cowboys or being a passionate stamp collector. We might say those are... <laughs> I think there's a new religion that just came out where the lady can wear a pump, you know, to drain your... It's like a drain drainer, and she's wearing it on her license plate. Like, she took a picture okay. of it. Okay, yes, yeah, 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 um, a colander. A colander, a colander. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some kind of religion about food, and so she wanted to take her picture with, the, with that thing on her head. Yeah, yeah, and then there's also... Um, a free thinkers have introduced the notion of uh, the flying spaghetti monster. Uh, it's called pasta, pastafarianism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at any rate, uh, I think we can talk about uh, s finding a way to separate the two out so that we get a, a notion of religion has these, this particular characteristic and those that are like a religion don't. And what I'm going to say is religions have a two-world view of reality. As far as religions are concerned, reality is divided into two worlds. I'll expand on that momentarily. Non-religions uh, then have only what we would call a one-world view of reality. So, could you be more specific, Sherney? And the answer is yes, I can. In fact, will. All right, let's take a look at the religious view, the two-world view here. And again, I think... Maybe I need to make this a little smaller so it all fit more comfortably. All right, so in this two-world view that religion has, the two worlds are the supernatural world up here in sort of the yellow or gold, and then 
the natural world down here. Uh, the supernatural world, and by the way, up here, down here, that's not just a, a throwaway. Uh, generally speaking, when religions talk about their two world view, the supernatural world is always up there. Um, and that's why, for example, worshipping on high places was initially very important to uh, religion before they settled in to using temples and so on. They would try to get higher, closer to uh, the, the, the supernatural. And, and you see that in the Old Testament where the, uh, the claim is that the uh, Mesopotamians try to build a, a tower to get to heaven, to Babel. I had Babel. All right. So, in the supernatural world, there. This is the uh, the world which contains gods or God, the supernatural, other supernatural beings such as angels, devils, ghosts, jinn, which is a, a Muslim supernatural being, and so on. The natural world is the realm of matter and energy and time and space. Virtually everybody <laughs> who's not uh, institutionalized. It acknowledges this world exists. The big question is whether the existence of this world. Notice also that from the, from the religious worldview, there is connections. There are communications between these two worlds. So the denizens in the supernatural world can communicate with the natural world by incarnations, by divine beings taking on bodies as either avatars or messiahs in some cases, uh, revelation, that somehow they can communicate to people down here, signs, miracles, those sorts of things. On the other hand, those of us who are down here, we can communicate and have contact with the supernatural world by prayer, ritual, meditation, sacrifice, those sorts of things. All right, so in, in, in this sense then, the religions, that, uh, the, the, the institutions that I said we all kind of agree are religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and so forth, they all have some version of, of this two world view. Whereas the institutions that I said are like a religion for some people, uh, but not religions, would include vegetarianism and rooting for a particular sports team or a passionate stamp collector, those have a one-world view. Now, there are some people, uh, obviously if you're a stamp collector or root for the Cowboys or um, a vegetarian, you can still have a two-world view. But I'm saying to be a vegetarian, the definition doesn't involve having a two-world view. You could be someone who has one. All right. There are people, as you probably know, who um, reject the two world view, and we can see that lined up here. Uh, so people who are atheists or agnostics will maintain that there's only one world, it's the natural world, and it exhausts reality. Uh, the supernatural world is rejected uh, on the basis of the claim that there's insufficient evidence to suppose that it exists. Where might a pantheist fit? Yeah, that's an interesting. <clears throat> Pantheism is the view that, as I understand it, that the entire physical universe, all the matter and energy and time and space, exhaust, exhaust reality. So it's sort of like this but that somehow or other this is divine in some sense. In some instances, people seem to seem, may, may invoke that there is a personality involved with the universe. Uh, I think some of the Gaia uh, theories are sort of like that, or even when we talk about Mother Nature, we seem to be saying that there's something that is kind of a person, but it's still not really a person, and so um, I. I I have confessed that I'm uh, not clear about pantheism because it seems as if if pantheism is true, then virtually nobody is an atheist, right? I mean, who, who's going to deny the existence of the physical universe as such? But I think it, we get into trouble here because sometimes 
scientists who know an awful lot about the universe uh, are very sloppy in their use of language. They start throwing the term God around when they really are just talking about nature and, and then you know, it gets us all into knots and so forth. Uh, Hawkins does that and even Einstein did it to some degree and it's uh, something that I hope is avoided in the future we get clear on this. All right, so fact number one, it's difficult to define religion, but I think the notion of a supernatural two-world view can separate out what are, is a religion from what isn't for the most part. Fact number two, historically, religions have been found in virtually all societies. Some notion of a two-world view, of a supernatural kind of world view, is, is a, something we find in, in all societies. We might want to, at some point, um, address the question of why that is the case. I'm not going to get into it right now unless you want to talk about it. Fact number three, we can sort out different types of religions. So we can talk about those religions that are monotheistic. The prefix mono is a Greek prefix meaning one, and theos is the Greek word for God, so monotheism means that there's only one divine being, or one, one nature divine being in that supernatural realm. These religions uh, then embrace that. Uh, the religion of Sikhism, and sometimes it's called Sikhism, but I've heard people who are close to that religion and they tend to use the word Sikh, even though in English, of course, it leads to snickering, I suppose. Um, by the way, uh, I live out by UTSA, and a Sikh, or Sikh community has built a nice um, uh, place of worship and gathering there. And they've been very friendly in the neighborhood. They invited people in for a supper and explaining Sikhism and so forth. And uh, uh, they, they, they are distinguished because the males wear turbans and they have beards. And they also carry a ceremonial dagger. And just recently, the, uh, the US has uh, allowed uh, Sikhs, American Sikhs, in the military to keep their beard and keep their turban as well as wear their uniform. So they've given, given sort of a dispensation for that. Um, then, then, of course, Judaism, Christianity, Islam are mono monotheistic. Uh, some people have trouble with Christianity being monotheistic, and the reason for that, of course, is the Trinity. The Trinity is, is a uh, a kind of metaphysical, uh, difficult area to describe how you can have one God but three gods and so on. And again, that'd be far beyond what we can get into here. But Christians maintain very stoutly that they are monotheistic and that if you're having trouble with the Trinity, well, join the party. It's a mystery. Uh, one that I, that I would mention here that is not often mentioned is Zoroastrianism, which is essentially uh, a religion that originated in what is today Persia. And its importance is that it, there's a good case to be made that the kind of monotheism that Judaism eventually developed into had and borrowed a great deal from Zoroastrianism. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later on in the presentation for you to think about more. All right. Besides monotheistic religions, of course, there are polytheistic religions, where the, the word poly means many in Greek. So traditional Hinduism, Mahayana Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, and most indigenous tribal religions uh, have many gods involved. What about Theravada? Uh, Theravada, Theravada, Theravada Buddhism is probably the original form of Buddhism, probably what Siddhartha, who is, his title is the Buddha, uh, really taught. And it's not even clear that that's any kind of theism. Uh, it, it seems like it's almost a self-help sort of thing. Uh, we've, got, we've got suffering in the world, it's a real downer, uh, but we have to live in this world. Let me tell you, I got a book here that, this is, this is if he were around today, he'd be on Oprah. I have a book here that tells you how to deal with suffering. Uh, and this is the important question of our time. 
and for $14.95, <laughs> you get the Kindle edition for $9.95, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's more of a self-help thing, really. Um, and and I, when it comes to that, this, does the, did Siddhartha have a two-world view? It's not clear. Not clear. All right. Then there are, oddly enough, non-theistic religions, and this is what I was just talking about. Uh, besides the Theravada Buddhism, Brahman, Brahmanic Hinduism might be in that category, depending on how you understand Brahman. And again, I don't want to get into details that go beyond the time we have here, but uh, Brahman is a kind of basic reality. In, in other forms, it might simply be called being, with a capital B, existence, or something like that. Um, original Taoism, likewise, the Tao is not supposed to be a person. It's, it's a kind of uh, part of the furniture of the universe. It's there, and uh, we, we need to react accordingly to it. And then Confucianism, which once again seems to be more a, a remedy for a society that's not functioning well. Confucius comes along and says, well, this is what we need to do to get China back out of its chaotic state. Um, it has very little to do with any kind of a supernatural realm. It's not clear if Confucius believed in that. And if he did, it was only because it helped cement us together. Uh, and he didn't really make it clear that he believed in any of that stuff. Do these have a dual world view? I don't think so. Well, again, if you think of the Tao as a sort of a supernatural thing, then yes. If you don't, then no. And likewise with Brahman. Uh, and uh, Confucian, uh, Confucianism certainly doesn't. It, it, it's somewhat surprising that it's, it's, it's included in books on world religions, because I think a good case can be made for the fact that it's more an ethical and a political a statement than, than a religious one. All right. Fact number four, religious demographics. For those of you who might be interested, um, Christianity is the most has the most adherence today. Uh, it comprises about 30% of the world's population. Uh, Islam is fairly close behind at 24%, and it seems to be catching up. Uh, the reason for that, in part, is because Islam is most prevalent in developing countries where the population is growing rather rapidly. Christianity um, is growing, but more, as we'll see in a minute, in a certain part, certain parts of the world. In, in the developing part of the world, Christianity seems to be declining in numbers. And then you see Hinduism is, uh, has over a billion. Hinduism is, basically, you're not too far wrong to say it's the religion of India. Uh, and so as the Indian population grows, Hinduism will grow. It's not as much of a widely spread religion as Christianity or Islam. And then you've got the others there. You can... What spiritism? What is spiritism? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I could speculate, but... Uh, well, I mean, that was sort of the, the non-religious but spiritual thing? I, uh, that could be. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. You've been, you've been here before. Uh, yeah. It seems yeah. to be. Don Dillon? Does that African um, angelicanism have anything to do with the Protestant evangelicalism? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, well, it does to some extent. Um, as you may know, Britain uh, or the United Kingdom had numerous colonies throughout Africa. And the official religion of England, at any rate, is the Anglican Church. Of course, Anglican is just another word for English. And so where the English colonies were, they brought their churches, and to, to this day, you find in places like Nigeria, Uganda, um, and other of those areas there, they have an Anglican presence. But that Anglican church presence is much more evangelical, meaning it's, it's much more emotional, uh, it's much more um, a matter of witnessing and converting others Whereas the English Anglicanism, the, find, the kind of Anglicanism that you find in England, is much more subdued, 
and, and laid back and isn't quite so evangelical. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs> I think the answer to your question is yes, it's, it's very evangelical, with a small e. It, it's, you know, it, it's not, uh, it still calls itself Anglican, so it has a priest. Why, why did they change it, the, the A and the E at all? Why is there a difference? Um, <clears throat> between English and Anglican? Yeah. Well, I think England is originally comes from the word, the, the land of the Angles, so Ang Anglo's land, Anglo's land, England, it, it just was easier for some tongues to get around that, I'm guessing. <clears throat> All right, so that's the demography. How about the, the geography of the religions? You can't quite see the colors as dramatically here, but this gives you the broad outline. Uh, there are some, I think, mistakes on this, but by and large, this mustard color represents where Christianity is the predominant religion. It doesn't mean everyone there is Christian. It doesn't even mean that a majority of the people there, but it means of whatever religions are there, Christianity is a plurality, and in some instances a large plurality. So you can see how widespread it is compared to the others. The next biggest religion, Islam, is the green here. And by the way, that's not an accident. Islam is a is a religion that has an unofficial color associated with it, and it's green uh, for various reasons. Uh, oases are very nice places. Um, and it includes Indonesia, North Africa, West Asia, Central Asia. Uh, I think that's a mistake. I don't think Muslims are a majority there. The line goes more across here. Below here is either Christian or animist, meaning tribal religions, and above it is Muslim. And then you've got Hindus here in India, um, you've got uh, Buddhism here, uh, Shintoism up here too, uh, and then Taoism and Confucianism here. And of course, Jews. Yeah. Right there too. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. All right, fact number six. I mentioned Zoroastrianism. And the fact that uh, when you study world religions, it isn't often the case that Zoroastrianism is studied. And one of the reasons for that is today the number of Zoroastrians in the world is probably only about the population of Corpus Christi uh, or thereabouts. But that notwithstanding, it is important, I think, to study Zoroastrianism because I believe scholars have made a pretty good case that Zoroastrianism had a profound effect on Judaism. And if so, that's important because Judaism, of course, had a profound effect on Christianity and Islam. So uh, to know something about Zoroastrianism is important in this respect. So what is the case, with uh, just laying it out in general? Uh, what we can do is we can identify writings in Judaism that were produced before the so-called Babylonian exile. You may remember from your biblical history that in the year 587-586, Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonians came and conquered uh, Judah, the kingdom of Judah. Remember the northern kingdom of Israel that had been uh, conquered by the Assyrians 150 years earlier, and the ten tribes were lost to history. They were probably incorporated and spread around the Assyrian Empire and basically uh, just became uh, the religion that they were lived around. But Judah, uh, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, hung on for another 150 years, but by 587 they were overtaken by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and the Babylonians did what they usually did uh, when they conquered a people they selected out anyone who could be a focal point for resistance and then in their mind that meant anybody who had wealth or power or prestige or high standing or learning um, those people were oddly enough you would think the Bible might just execute them um, but they didn't do that. They took them and they migrated them over to Babylon and settled them in around the city. So uh, 
And it was sort of like a house arrest. It wasn't they were in prison or anything like that. They were able to set up their own community. And they did. Uh, and they were there uh, for 50, or about 47 to 50 years when uh, the Babylonians were overthrown by the new strong country on the block, and that was the Persians under Cyrus the Great. And so Cyrus told the Per, uh, told the, uh, the Israelites, or the Jews if you wish, that they can go back if they want, and he would even help them rebuild the temple which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. Uh, not all of them went back, oddly enough. They kind of liked it there. It was like, what? Go back to, to Nebraska when we've been living in Manhattan? I'm not sure I want to do that, but okay, some of them did anyway. They did go back. All right, so then we see the writings that occurred after they were in Babylonian captivity and compare the two and we can see maybe the influence of being in Babylon. I should add, of course, that the major religion in Babylon at the time that they were in captivity was a form of Zoroastrianism. So, let's put it together in, in, a, in a quick form here. Before the Babylonian captivity, Judaism lacked a significant Satan figure. It lacked a resurrection of the body at the, uh, after death. It lacked much, uh, much of a concern for even life after death at all. Uh, Jews basically used to talk about um, going to Sheol, which was very similar to the Greek notion of Hades. It was some dark, dank cavern down below the earth, and your soul went there, flitted about in the shadows and the darkness, and eventually just like a flame a candle, it went out. Uh, but that will, that will change after they get back from Babylon. Uh, they didn't have a real notion of heaven or hell before uh, they came back. Uh, there was no reference to God's plan to end the world. There's no final day of judgment. There wasn't much mention of angels and demons. However, once they come back from the Babylonian Empire, Judaism did start having references to these things in their writings. And by the time of Jesus, it was an important part of uh, Judaism, at least for some versions of Judaism, and most importantly for the Pharisaic versions. Remember the Pharisees. It's kind of ironic that the Pharisees get very bad press in the, in the New Testament. They're always fussing with Jesus, and Jesus is always sparring with them, and he has some very um, accurate things to say about them, right? They're whited sepulchers, you know, they're all white and shiny on the outside, but inside they contain filth and degradation and uh, that sort of thing. But it turns out that Pharisaic Judaism is the kind of Judaism that eventually permeated Christianity probably in part because of the great influence of Paul of Tarsus, who proudly declared himself a Pharisee and having been educated that way. So all of these kinds of things then go into post-Babylonian uh, Judaism and then from Judaism into Christianity and also later on into Islam. So the Zoroastrian connection is a very fascinating one and it's one that very few people in the West know a whole lot about, and yet it is important, I think. All right, fact number seven of the eight facts. Uh, worldwide, Christianity is becoming, and I'm coining a term here, forgive me, southernized. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, Christianity, in terms of numbers of adherents and vitality, is relatively stagnant or slumping in the northern or developed tier of countries, such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and most of the countries of Europe. All right. uh, notice I didn't include the United States in there, and, and also some of these are not in the northern hemisphere, uh, but they are considered the developing countries, and somehow or other the term northern is used. Uh, all right. On the other hand, Christianity still does well in the southern or developing tier of countries, such as the poorer countries of South and Central America and the Caribbean, countries of Black Africa, and the Philippines. Now, the U.S. is kind of um, 
an outlier here to some degree. We are obviously a developed country, but um, we still have a pretty robust Christianity. However, if you peek behind the curtain, it turns out that of the indigenous Americans, the numbers of Christians are dropping. The reason why in aggregate it doesn't show is because we're bringing in lots of immigrants, uh, basically from the Philippines and from Central and South America, um, who are religious and who are Christians. And so the number of Christians is maintaining in the United States, but m that's mostly due to immigration. Uh, that has uh, a, a lot of, uh, I, I think, important uh, ramifications, given that religion plays such an important role in our country in terms of domestic and foreign policy. If indeed religion is diminishing, uh, then that might change how the U.S. interacts with the rest of the world. I spoke a little bit about that in, in a presentation I gave earlier in the semester. All right, the last a uh, uh, question here is, or fact, is that the U.S. is much more religious than any other developed country in the world. So when you compare, compare even the U.S. with Canada, which is probably culturally the closest to us, and there is a discernible difference in the number of adherents, the number of people who pray daily, the number of people who say that religion is important in their lives, and when you move over to Europe, it's even more dramatic, especially Northern Europe. Uh, and part of the, the difficulty we sometimes have with our European friends is that they think we're a little bit religiously wignutty, and we think that they are craven secularists who have lost all their values and guide, guide and so on. So there is that kind of a tension, especially with the French, of, of, oddly enough, uh, because the French are consider themselves very secular and, and uh, it, it, for, for, for religious people in this country, they tend to look at the French and think, ah, that's, see, that's what happens when you become, uh, go away from religion. Uh, of course, the French don't seem to think their country is all that bad. All right, so those, that essentially uh, completes the facts that I wanted to share with you. By the way, if you want to contact me more to talk about any of these things, but you'd rather not do it in this kind of communal environment. My office is upstairs at 2.30, and my email uh, is there, and I'd be happy to meet with you in any way. As philosophers have mouth, we'll talk, uh, and that operates with me all the time. So um, I, I pointed out certain questions that you might want to pursue here, including this last one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end there and uh, let you guys uh, start getting involved here and participate. Who would like to start? Anybody? Yes? Um, why was it Catholic long in there? Or? Good question. What about Catholics? Uh, as it turns out, and, and this is a, 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 a kind of a misconception that students, I, I find, have, not, not just students, but people, down in this part of the, the world, uh, this part of the country, um, they'll say something like, uh, "Well, I'm not, I'm not a, a Catholic. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian." And the fact of the matter is that Catholics consider themselves to be Christians, and they have a good case for it. So uh, you can talk about Catholic Christians, you can talk about Evangelical Christians, you can talk about Pentecostal Christians. It's all in the same vein. <laughs> And it turns out, too, that Catholic Christians comprise about half of all Christians, too. So they're, they're not to be um, forgotten as, as being a part of uh, the house of Christianity. Yeah. Anybody um, have any ideas about three and four? Why, why is it that Christianity is flourishing in the developing countries, but not in the developed countries. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I think there's a lot of hope in, in Christianity. And so I guess in a poor country, you kind of need that type of hope. Whereas here, we're more about ourselves. I mean, we already have luxury. Um, so yeah. Well, but it's not so much here, because 
the United States still has a pretty high level of religiosity, um, but it would be those other areas, uh, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, Canada. But still, I think your point is, is on target. You know? I think, like you said, Christianity is more evan evangelical, so they're going to go out and spread the word, and they're going to go to those countries that are hurting because uh, Christianity is a, a faith of hope. And so they're going to go out there and reach out to those people. Why am I going to go to someone who's already established and has a way of thinking, trying to change their mind, and they won't, you know, whereas I can go somewhere that someone's looking for hope, and you can bring it to them. Yeah. And then Islam, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure they're spreading their word, but I don't think it's as evangelical as um, Christianity. Yeah, they don't have they don't have the formal apparatus that Christianity has, but they they're also still pretty effective. Um, the the main battle area, by the way, between trying to get converts uh, between Christianity and Islam is Africa, and all, all the rest of the world is pretty well settled in one way or the other. But in in Africa, there are still a lot of tribal religions and. The, the Western religions see them as, as uh, potential customers, and so they kind of scramble, uh, and it causes trouble because the two are competing against each other. It's like two sales people in the same mall trying to sell the same thing, or similar things. Yeah, it, it becomes a real problem that way. Um, but both of what you said are backed up by studies that claim to show that religion tends to be more prevalent, as, as you especially pointed out, where people are in need. Um, when you look at most of Europe, especially Northern Europe, when you look at Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you find that those countries have um, political and social institutions that pretty much allow people to live uh, a free and prosperous life. And so religion doesn't seem to be nearly as necessary. There's also a connection between amount of education and religion. Um, even in the United States, if you, if you survey people, you see that the most religious groups are those who have only an elementary school education. When you move up to those who have a high school education, the number of uh, strong adherents diminishes. When you get to a college education, it diminishes more. When you get to graduate, it diminishes more. And so in the developed countries where the formal education is more readily available, you have more formally educated people. I'm, I'm not saying they're smarter people, I'm just saying they have a more education, and therefore, generally, they'll have less religious connections. Is that because science is now an education of study now? I think that there's something to that, Dylan, that, that uh, when, it's a combination of when your, your, your needs are being taken care of by the social and political institutions and your intellect is aware of scientific explanations that very often seem to eclipse the religious explanations, it's pretty hard for most educated people, for example, to accept a literal interpretation of, of a sub-10,000 year old universe when science is virtually unanimous that the, the universe is 13.8 billion years old and the earth is 4.6 and they've got plenty of evidence. So that diminishes um, people's uh, ability. That and also their willingness to uh, put their credibility into organizations that contradict science. Yes, sir. Yeah, and like you were saying, like people like with master's degrees, I guess it goes lower and lower the percentage of people that believe in religion, but we're just so used to having empirical evidence because you see studies after studies proving this or that, and Christianity is, is a, a, a religion based on faith. So that's why it's hard for people to accept. Well, it's and hard for Jesus it's hard, always yeah. talked in, in parables, too. So. Well, it's hard for some people to accept, for sure. Yeah. And, and I, I think, as, you, as I was saying, and you indicated, too, uh, again, as long as there's food on the table and you have freedom in your life, uh, there's not a whole lot to pray for. Uh, yeah, and furthermore, exactly. again, you've got the education to see that some of the more restricted interpretations of religion uh, are untenable with science. Now, I will add that 
many uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims uh, try not to pick a fight with science and try to, quote, reinterpret the earlier scriptures. Well, it's not really 10,000 years old. It's just that, you know, uh, every, a day is a thousand years for, uh, in, for God. But, of course, notice, by the way, that doesn't get you out. That means uh, it's still going to be less than 4.6 billion years old. But they'll do that reinterpretation and uh, say it was a metaphor or poetry or something like that. And that, that's helpful to people who have a, a good understanding of the physical world but still want to be religious. They can say, you yeah, know, that's it. We don't have to believe it literally. But, um, but that causes problems because the literalists then think that those people are not really true Christians if they're going away from understanding. A lot of, a lot of uh, dynamics going on with respect to all of that. Okay, again, I thank you for being here. And if you want to contact me once again, feel free to do so. I love to talk about this stuff. Uh, and I hope you have a, a good rest of your day and enjoy uh, the weekend and do well for the rest of the semester.